Sape satta bhavantu sukhitatta bhavantu sukhitatta Hello, I'm Dave Jacobson, and I'm here with the ninth episode of Nibbana, The Secret Treasure of the Buddhas. This time we're going to talk about why is Nibbana called Nibbana? Well, remember last time we talked about the reciprocal relationship between fire and wood. In other words, a fire is not possible unless you have two things, fuel and combustion, like the wood and the flames. And if you separate them, or if the fuel runs out, the fire goes out. Where does it go? Well, it doesn't go anywhere. It just ceases. This is called Nibbana, or extinguishing the fire. And in the Buddha's time, the word Nibbana was a common word referring to fire going out. And so, actually, in one sutta, there are 33 terms given for the ultimate state of the Buddha. But Nibbana came to be the most commonly used one precisely because of this simile of the fire. The simile of the fire is very, very important because it precisely illustrates the principle of specific causation, of the interdependence of phenomena and their causes. Remember a few episodes back in part one, we were talking about Nama Rupa and how name and form have a reciprocal relationship. You have nominal form and formal name. And because of this, they cannot exist separate from one another. If you get rid of one, the other one goes away. If you get rid of the other one, the first one goes away. The same is true of fire and fuel. So the simile of the fire, we find it again and again in the Buddha's words, in the suttas. So let's take a look into this, why this word Nibbana became uh, the epithet or the uh, expression used to describe the ultimate state of consciousness, the ultimate state of self-realization. One of the problems the Buddha faced in his teaching work was that people called him an annihilationist, a nihilist, someone who believes in nothing, and especially after death, that there is nothing, nothingness, and like that. And of course, that's not what the Buddha uh, taught at all. Still, he became subject to these accusations because of the word extinction, extinguishing, nibbana. So he's not talking about the extinction of the being. He's talking about the extinction of becoming, manifesting, coming into being in the world. This is a very fine distinction. And a lot of people couldn't make it, couldn't understand it during the Buddha's time. Because don't forget, the Vedic tradition in which he appeared was very much a positivist tradition, an eternalist tradition, uh, where the soul, Atma, the self, or the being, was considered to be eternal. And that the being simply comes into being at a certain point, comes into manifestation at a certain point, and then leaves again. But there's this other world where he lives eternally. So the Buddha was trying to say, no, there is no other world. This is the world, <laughs> the world we've got right now. So not that you cease to exist in terms of uh, soul or a conscious entity, but that there is no self, there is no soul, there is no eternal being, uh, because being always has a beginning and an end. Anything that is existing in time is subject to the force of time, which drags us through the cycle of manifestation from becoming to death, and there's no way to escape that. So rather, well, I'll let the Buddha speak for himself. 
He was accused by a wandering ascetic named Vachagota of annihilationism. And let's read what the Buddha replied. And how is the bhikkhu a noble one whose banner is lowered, whose burden is lowered, who is unfettered? Here, a bhikkhu has abandoned the conceit I am, has cut it off at the root so that it is no longer subject to future arising. That is how the bhikkhu is a noble one whose banner is lowered, whose burden is lowered, who is unfettered. So saying, bhikkhus, so proclaiming, I have been baselessly, vainly, falsely, and wrongly misinterpreted by some recluses and brahmins thus. The recluse Gotama is one who leads astray. He teaches the annihilation, the destruction, the extermination of an existing being. As I am not, as I do not proclaim, so I have been baselessly, vainly, falsely, and wrongly misrepresented by some recluses and Brahmins thus. The recluse Gotama is one who leads astray. He teaches the annihilation, the destruction, the extermination of an existing being. And then the Buddha goes on to give the water snake simile, the raft simile, and so many others, including the fire simile. He says, to paraphrase, Now, if a fire is burning in front of you, dependent on grass and twigs as fuel, you would know that it is burning dependently and not independently, that there is no fire in the abstract. And when the fire goes out with the exhaustion of that fuel, you would know that it has gone out because the conditions for its existence are no more. So let's go over this passage because it has a lot of insights that are useful to our topic here. First of all, the Buddha talks about a bhikkhu, a monk, someone dedicated to the pursuit of self-realization, to the practice of meditation and so on. And he calls him a noble one. A noble one means that his existence is now dedicated to the benefit of all. He's no longer simply concerned with his own welfare, but with the welfare of everyone, every being in the entire universe. This is a noble one, a bodhisattva, a bhikkhu, a monk. Now we see a lot of monks these days who seem to only be concerned with the welfare of their own little sect or their own temple or their own little group or school or whatever you want to call it. We don't really support that view. Uh, the Buddha certainly doesn't support it either. But he says the bhikkhu, a monk, is one whose banner is lowered. Huh? In those days, when two armies would fight, they would have flag carriers in the front lines. And you would look, if you were a soldier in the battle, you would look to see where your flag was going, what was happening with it. Because usually the flag bearer would be near the leader, near the general or the king who was leading the battle. And if anything happened to the king, then he would lower the banner. The king is, is hurt or the king is dead. Or the king is retreating. <laughs> so you would follow the banner. So what does it mean? If your flag is lowered, you surrendered. You're not fighting the battle anymore. You're not trying to establish this self in the world and maintain it and protect it against the forces of time and so on. You have laid down the burden. You're no longer trying to create this artificial fabricated self. You're not any longer trying to do the impossible task of maintaining an eternal identity, an eternal self, an eternal being, because it's not possible. This is such an effort. And when you drop it, the feeling of relief is so palpable. I remember the first time I tried actually meditating on this idea of no self. You know, I had been into Vedic culture for many years, 
and had even become a guru and so on, but I was still unsatisfied. So when I started studying the Buddha's teaching, I was reading books by Buddha Das Bhikkhu. And one of the uh, books talked about this idea of no self, which in the beginning I found extremely counterintuitive because it seemed to be annihilationism. It seemed to be uh, the extinction of the being. But I said, well, just for the heck of it, to give it a fair try, I should do this meditation on no self. And so I tried for a few days. I was in Thailand, uh, living in a nice beach place, a small island called Koh Tao. And I can remember sitting on the beach early in the morning. The sun was just coming up. And it's like I could feel this tremendous relief. And the, the tears of joy were literally running down my face because I was like, Oh, so relieved I don't have to carry this burden anymore. I don't have to make this false, fabricated self anymore. It's such an effort. You know, it's like, it's like when you lie. You know, when you tell a lie to someone, then you have to remember what I, what I told them. And let me see, uh, what was the reason for it? And then um, what do these other people think? And do I have to tell the same lie to them? And, oh, did I tell the truth to someone? Well, then I have to, like, keep those people separate and so on and so on. It's such a big effort. It's much easier to just tell the truth, you know, because it's going to come out anyway. And then you're going to look really bad. So you might as well just <laughs> avoid the whole issue by telling the truth from the beginning. And the same thing is true of the self. It's a big effort, a big problem to maintain this self. Better to just let it go. It doesn't mean the end of everything. It just means the end of a particular fabrication, a particular lie. Huh? One of the meanings of fabrication is a lie. And so this self that we all claim to have <laughs> is like that. It's just a lie. Okay. Now, I've created this whole identity Dave Jacobson, and uh, I'm giving these talks on Nibbana and all this stuff, right? But I'm very much aware that it's a fabrication. I'm very much aware that that's not my real self, and it's certainly not eternal. So the difference is not in how we act or how we behave necessarily. The difference is in how we see ourselves, our view, and the amount of effort that I put into this uh, fabrication for the purpose of teaching or sharing is much less than if I was trying to maintain Dave Jacobson as an identity all the time. You know, when I step away from the camera, I can drop it. I can just be nobody. <laughs> it's very easy. <laughs> so anyway, the banner is lowered. The burden is lowered. He is unfettered. Unfettered means he's free from bondage. A fetter is a bondage, like a chain or handcuffs or something like that. So it means he's unfettered from what? Unfettered from ignorance, unfettered from ego, unfettered from I and mine. He says, here a bhikkhu has abandoned the conceit I am. I am is a conceit. Huh? It's like, uh, you know, when we get our fingernails done at the uh, manicurist, you know, and it's like, you know, it, it's conceit. <laughs> it's a kind of narcissism. It's a kind of self-love. It's, oh, I am. You know, it, it's really a construction, really a phony, false kind of thing. And when we become aware of this, we realize how much effort we put into constructing this false self. It's a fetter. It's a bondage, just like the bondage of the liar to the lies that he's created and how much effort he has to put out to avoid them being discovered. And it's all futile in the end. They come out anyway. So he has cut off, abandoned the conceit, I am, cut it off at its root. So there will be no longer any further arising of this idea. So how do we do that? 
Well, we talked about in the previous section the Mulaparayaya Sutta and how this describes the root sequence or the process of creating the I and mind and how we create the I in terms of mind. So this illusory concept, I, is, is never directly created, but it's simply inferred by the claim of mine. My camera, my table, my body, my this, my that, my cup of tea. <laughs> so all these things are supposedly mine. They are like pointers to this I. But if you go looking for the eye, you can't find it. Where is it? Can you show it to me? Can I show it to you? No. No. It's simply inferred by these claims of my this and my that, my body, my computer, my whatever. But this eye doesn't really exist. It's not a concrete entity. You can't show it. You can't find it. You can't see it. Where is it? That's because it's not there. So once you realize this, once you actually go through the exercise recommended in the Mulaparyaya Sutta and observe the different layers of conception required to create this illusion of I, then it can never arise again because you're totally aware of the process. You know, it's just like any kind of bad habit. If you've ever quit smoking, for example, to quit smoking successfully, you have to go back and dig up the reason why you started in the first place. Otherwise, you won't be able to quit smoking just by a force of will. You have to remove the cause. You have to remove the reason for it. So similarly, to cut off this I am at the root so it doesn't come back, you have to dig up the process that created it in the first place. That's the creation of mind. So by creating mind, we create the I. As soon as you lay that banner down, lay that burden down, don't accept any more assets, don't accept any more attachments, identifications, and so on, then it's possible to relinquish this I, I am. And it's such a relief. So, this is how the bhikkhu is a noble one. That he has laid down this I am. He's no longer just living for himself. He's no longer concerned with self-benefit. Rather, his concern is the benefit of all living beings. That's a noble one. That's a noble purpose. And that's the noble path also. So, the Buddha, so saying, had been wrongly accused of being an annihilationist, uh, one who teaches the annihilation or destruction or extermination of an existing being. Why? Because of this term Nibbana. Nibbana simply means going out. When the fire goes out, it's not like it's destroyed. It's simply that the cause and effect relation between the fuel and the flame is interrupted. So then there's no more fire. Unless the fuel and the flame are in the proper relationship, there is no fire. There is only a fire when that relationship exists. So that means what we call a fire isn't really a thing. It's a relationship. A relation between fuel and the process of oxidation, burning. So anytime that relation is broken or does not apply for any reason, then you don't have a fire. Uh, if you have some fuel over here and some heat over here, there's no fire. It's only when the fuel and the heat come together, then the fire is possible. So similarly, until you bring together this process of I making and my making, uh, you don't have an I. A baby doesn't have an I. A baby doesn't have a self. A baby doesn't consider anything to be mine. 
except maybe my mommy. <laughs> but in other words, there is no ego, there is no self. Or whatever self there is, is in a very primitive, undeveloped state. But only later on, when we grow up, then the I becomes more and more solid until we start to dream about things like the soul. The soul is eternal. I am forever. And some people even want to say, I am everything. I am God. I mean, really, this is insanity. Okay? It's a form of madness. So, uh, you know, when this dream of I am gets blown up to the point where one wants to identify with everything, well, that means one also claims proprietorship over everything, control over everything. And those are clearly unsupportable claims. So the Buddha was attacking this idea of I am the soul, I am God, I am everything, which were common ideas in his time, even today. So he was wrongly accused of annihilationism, but actually the Buddha rejected both extremes of annihilationism and eternalism. And he found the middle path in between. And the middle path is the path of specific causality, Paticca Samuppada. And soon we're going to have an episode that focuses on Paticca Samuppada, goes through the different steps and identifies them all. But for now, the thing you need to know is that Nibbana, the attainment of enlightenment, is the result of a certain type of becoming, a certain process of being, such that one comes to the end of being and becoming, that one can actually lay down this process of creating an I am, I and mine, and become a noble one whose interest includes the benefit of all beings. Sabbe satta bhavantu sukhitatta bhavantu sukhitatta